Hi there, welcome back. We're back to the HH Scott 460A integrated amplifier. And this is the amp that uh, had a bit of a bath. If you haven't seen that video, I'll link uh, to that above. I did a cleanup of this thing with a rather unconventional method for me, that is, uh, by putting it in uh, water and uh, dish soap. And the cleanup was actually very good and the result was it stayed exactly the same in terms of fault. It didn't get worse. There was no smoke. There were no explosions. And I also found out as a result of probably, I think, 90 comments in the first day that my non-conventional method was actually quite conventional for a lot of people. So anyway, carrying on, I decided now to go ahead to the stage of trying to repair this thing. Now, what this was doing was it was switching on and it would go into protection and it would come out of protection, go back into protection. So what I've decided to do here is to set it up for a quick test and to try and see on the scope what it is that we're actually getting. I've got the uh, selection to auxiliary input, normal, that means stereo, um, put the volume on zero, balance in the center. All these filters are off. All the tone controls are centered. Actually, I'll make that flat so that we bypass the tone controls. Speaker selection to A. And when I switch on, I'll just be switching on there. Feeding the signal in and we'll look at the scope and see what we're getting. Now, I've also got the speakers connected to the uh, audio dummy load selector. I can select speaker or dummy. I've ch chosen dummy on both sides, left and right. I've got 8 ohm dummy load selected. I've connected each channel to one channel of the scope, which is DC coupled. So we can see what's happening with the uh, DC condition of the output, which seems to be one of the problems that's causing the, um, the protection circuit to kick in. I've got my uh, lamp limiter with two bulbs selected. I can actually do one for now. That's a 40 watt bulb in series. It's going through the isolation transformers, so there's no earth, mains earth connected. Bypass is, set, uh, is on, so it's uh, selected to limit. And it's on, and I'm getting 229 volts uh, mains voltage. It's sort of right, about 230 over here. And when I switch on, which I'm going to do now, we should see that guy come on very bright and then go dim somewhat as the uh, filter caps charge. But we'll see. Let's hit it. There we go. And the relays kicked in. In other words, the protection circuit is not activated. It's drawing 140 milliamps. It's seeing 179 volts AC. That bulb is sort of at half glow. I'm going to give it another light bulb, which is a 60 watt light bulb. Uh oh, it's doing something. It's pulling more current. Can you see that? It's not really shorting because that current there is not going crazy. But it is seeing something. Now, what I want to see it on the scope, let me show you. What we're actually seeing on the scope is that the DC state of one of the channels, actually both, is fluctuating quite badly. What I'm going to do is actually see if we've got an audio signal. I'm putting the volume up. Yeah, we do. But can you see that? Whoop. Protection's kicked in. Now the protection's kicking in quite quickly. It's drawing 260 milliamps. This is what it was doing originally. Okay. So the audio signal is going through. The problem seems to be that the uh, DC offset situation, the DC condition of the output is going crazy. And I'm going to switch this off before I do any more damage. Okay, this has been opened up now. And just to let you know, when I did the cleaning of that bottom board there, that's the turn board. I replaced the caps, 
When I did the input selector and phono board, I replaced the caps. I did not replace the caps on the power amplifier stage. So I think the first thing I'm going to do is that. Obviously what it seems to be doing is it doesn't seem to be a short on the output transistors because otherwise that uh, light bulb would just glow bright all the time. I think it's got to do with the bias condition and that could have to do with capacitors that are leaking on there. I've just seen uh, a video by Simon Spears who showed us one uh, situation where one of the electrolytic caps was leaking and it was uh, creating the protection fault. So the first things first, I'm going to recap, replace all the electrolytics on that board. It shouldn't be too difficult because I've got access to the components from this side and I've got access to the board from the underside. I removed the plate at the bottom, which comes off quite nicely. So this thing becomes fairly easy to maintain. I think the power supply is fine. I just need to look at that amp board. And that's what I'll do next. Okay, all the uh, capacitors have been swapped out of the power amp. And I, as you can see, there aren't that many. If you hear, all these were swapped out. Good quality caps. And what I found was that uh, most of them were actually very, very poor. The, uh, there were some here, there are quite a few here that are one microfarad, 100 volt micro, uh, capacitors. And the ESR on those things was way out. So what I did was I decided to give it a test. And I did film that, but as usual, I'm a little bit more careful with the restorations than I am with the filming and lost some footage, but I'll fill you in as to what happened. When I swapped out the caps, I tested it again. I was actually filming the scope and uh, it was better, but still floating, so floating up. So the one output, and it was the same output, it was this side here, was still uh, creeping into positive DC offset and it would go on and on and on till finally it would trip the protection relay. So what I did is I started going for the transistors in here and diodes because usually that's what goes wrong first. The first one I did was I looked at this uh, transistor over here. This is a dual transistor. It's actually two transistors in one package and it's uh, part of the differential amplifier at the right of the input of the amp. So I decided to start from there, and because I didn't have these guys, I took it out, knowing it was this channel, not that one, and I replaced it with two equivalent transistors, properly wired. I think this is uh, B, C, E, E, B, E, C, B. So you've got to make sure you put them on the right way. They're actually tacked into the bottom. And when I switched it on, lo and behold, the problem of the offset disappeared. So that's sort of where we've got so far. Full recapping of this section, which is just to match the others that I've done already, and replaced this transistor here on that channel. Now, if this thing is all that's wrong with it, I'm gonna to have to find, I'm going to buy more transistors and uh, try and get a better uh, balance between them. So match them. I didn't do much matching. I just put two in that were the same, the same transistor, not necessarily the same batch or anything like that. So um, the more closely matched these two are, the better the offset should be. But we'll test it now. And if that is the case, then I'm going to do the same for that one there, just to make sure both sides stay the same. So let me set it up and see what we've got. Okay, it's all set up, ready to go. I'm going to, I've got it in the, on the dim bulb limiter anyway. I've got this thing going to the dummy load 8 ohms and each channel is connected to the scope. I've got a 300 millivolt RMS 1 kilohertz signal coming into the two channels and I'll switch it on. It's drawing, protection relay is just kicked in. And I'm now going to give it some volume. Well, we need to change the time base, don't we? Here we go. I'm going to give it another lamp. So we've got 210 volts coming in now. 
and I'm going to give it the final lamp, so minimum restriction. It's drawing just under 300 milliamps. And it looks like we've got one channel slightly lower than the other, which is fine for now, considering we've got two different sets of transistors on here. Make sure the balance is in the middle. The balance works. You can cheat and do this, but let's keep it in the middle. I've got the tone bypassed. Everything seems normal. Just increase the volume. Give it 5 volts per division. And the light bulbs are really going crazy now. It's drawing 300 milliamps. I don't want to quite um, take it off protection just yet. But what we see here is this thing is working fine. There's no DC offset. And in fact, the tracking isn't so bad in terms of uh, amplitude on the two as you get to higher volumes. What have we got? 5 volts RMS, that's uh, 25 by about 8, it's about 3 watts. The light bulbs are glowing. Okay, it's coming up, it's starting to clip there. Okay, I'm going to bypass the limit now. And look what happens. So, when I put this on, I tested it like that. Obviously, I tested it at much lower levels and I thought, right, we've got this thing sorted. I was wrong, because when you go higher, This thing's clipping. The one channel is clipping. And it's clipping at, what is that, 9.6 volts RMS. So it's clipping at half of 28, 14 volts. So 26 volts peak to peak, it starts clipping exactly the same on both sides. Which is kind of strange. It's only happening on the one channel. So something is reducing the effective um, range that I have. And now this is very strange because the power supply would normally do that. Let me get this 10 volts per division. Where, where, where you'd normally see that clipping is when you reach the peak or the, the, the limits of your power supply. But the power supply is actually supplying both channels. And as you can see, that channel just, just keeps going up. I mean, we're already at 20 volts RMS, so we're getting near the peak uh, power. It's only happening on the one side, so that leads me to believe that it's not the power supply. It also tells us something else. It is actually symmetrical. It's clipping the same at the same voltage, positive as it is negative. So. It would look like a supply issue. Let me get that down. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to look at the output from the preamp board and see if the uh, see if it's doing that. See if the signal is being clipped at the preamp or at the power amp. Something else we can do is actually take it off the speaker. Just leave it floating so that's off now there's no speaker and there's no load at all and you see that's strange because now it doesn't clip anymore so whatever it is it's something that's dependent on the load on the output load that it's seeing so it would seem to be power amp related hmm now if i put that again Got the same problem. Okay, back to the drawing board. But that's uh, where we are at the moment. I'm going to have another look at this. It could be, it could actually be again a biasing problem. It could be a diode that reaches a certain threshold and then starts conducting. And it might be conducting on a differential, which is why you get the same positive as you do negative. But I need to investigate. I think first things first is I need to make sure it's not the preamp. 
But as I said, because it's load related, you see, if I do that, take the load off, it just goes clean. And now it goes very clean all the way to, we go 10 volts per division, all the way to, well, as high as this thing can go, really. I need to put a 10 times probe here to see where exactly it clips. I've got this as one to one, so um, my scope doesn't actually allow me to go any further in volts per division. All right, some more searching to do. Okay, I found something. I had an inspiration which was to try and check or to check the bias current, the crescent current that was going through the uh, the two channels. And the way to do that according to the schematic is you put a multimeter across those two resistors. So those two are the uh, emitter resistors of the driver transistors. And because they are, what is it, 0.47 ohms, you then know that uh, whatever voltage you get you divide by 2 times 0.47 ohms and you get the current. Now what they tell you to do is to look for 40 millivolts, set it to 40 millivolts across those two. And the way you set it in this particular case is with that little trimmer pot down there, that one right in the middle there. And there's another one here on there. And then you've got another two trimmers down here, those two just next to the relay, but that's to do with the metering. So you adjust the, the crescent current for the one channel with that trim pot, you adjust the crescent current for that channel, the other channel with that uh, trim pot. And uh, so I decided to try it. And the reason I decided to try it is that um, because this thing was load related, I could have had some really crazy crescent current going through there or none at all. It wasn't really none at all because then you'd get massive crossover distortion. But uh, it could have been something that was then dragging the supply down on that part of the circuit. Anyway, I went and tried that. And what happened was I put it across those two resistors there for the working channel. And I managed to adjust that. It was slightly off. I think it was at about 32 millivolts. I managed to adjust it and set it at 40 millivolts exactly. Then I tried to do this one and I'm going to reproduce it and show you what happens. I'm going to switch the amp on now. Relay clicks on, shoots up, shoots, floats around. And we're talking about 1.2, 2.83 millivolts. Quite far from 40, right? Very far from 40. So now, you're supposed to leave this for about, well, a few minutes. But we can see it's pretty much down at the bottom. And if I then go in here and trim it the one way. It's at max. If I trim it counterclockwise, it's going up, going up, going up, going up. And that's the top. That's the most it'll go, 9.6 milliamps. Now, that is a quarter what it should be, 10 milliamps. So, what does it tell us? Well, what it tells me, let me just put it back more or less to where it was. What it tells me is that we've got something wrong with that, um, with the bias circuit. And it actually looks like it could be on that main chain or the main uh, bias network that we have there. This is our schematic. And the part that we're interested in is that thing over there. That there is the one channel of the power amp. That there is the other channel of the power amp. The one that's giving us trouble is this one over here. What we have here, if we follow the signal path, is that the signal comes in here through that capacitor, DC blocking capacitor, comes in here, and then it goes into this uh, dual transistor, which is the one we've replaced, 
and the two I've replaced the two transistors, separate transistors, that I've replaced this uh, dual transistor with. The characteristics are good enough to uh, to match quite closely what this thing would be doing. We then have another section. If we follow this, uh, going from left to right on the schematic, if we follow all the way through, we get to this point over here. Now this point over here is actually where the signal comes out to your speakers. I mean it goes through an inductor and resistor but then it ultimately gets to your speaker. So what we're looking at is the section between where your speaker signal comes out and where your signal comes in. And what we have here besides this dual transistor is basically we've got a top side and a bottom side. The actual matched pairs is the section from this transistor and that transistor onwards. We have matched transistors above the ground line, above the line, call that the ground line for now, I'll explain in a second, and matched transistors below the line. The actual circuitry is identical. So what is happening here? Well. As is typical in uh, class AB, you've got these transistors at the top amplifying the positive going half cycle and these transistors at the bottom are amplifying the negative going half cycle around what should be at this point zero volts. Now after replacing this transistor here, we have found that we have pretty close to zero volts over there. That's your speaker out. And I'm talking DC volts. That's all we're interested in right now. So if we call this the output as close to zero as, well, as close to zero as you can get, then what happens above the line has to do with the positive going half cycle of a signal. And what happens below the line has to do with the negative half cycle of the signal. That is fine and good for these transistors over here. However, the problem that we're finding is that the clipping that's happening on the circuit is happening on the positive half cycle and the negative half cycle. It's called symmetrical clipping and it's happening to both half cycles at about the same point. So that tells us something very important and I might be completely wrong. This is me thinking out loud to try and see where I'm going to start looking for the problem. If the problem is in this section then that would mean we would have to have equal and opposite faults on these transistors. In other words, we would have to have a fault on the positive section of the signal exactly the same as one on the negative section of the signal, which means it's very unlikely. You'd have to have exactly the same transistors or opposite transistors with the same fault. So I'm inclined to think that the problem is not on these transistors over here, which it might still be there, there might still be another problem, we don't know. The only part that, that doesn't follow this logic of equal and opposite are these two over here. It's this network over here. And what we have over here is actually quite interesting. We have the positive supply voltage over here. 47 volts according to the schematic you can barely read it, but it's there. We have negative 47 volts over here So positive supply negative supply Where's the ground in all this? Well, that's the interesting thing this middle line over here That we've just said is the output the speaker line the speaker output is not really connected to ground It's close to zero volts if the circuits are working well but it's not really connected to ground. That means that the DC conditions at two points, this point over here, or more specifically this point over here, and that point over there, are crucial. Whatever DC voltage you have here and there are crucial to set this point at zero volts. That is your bias point. That's what sets the bias of these transistors. In fact, more specifically, this transistor, that transistor. Let's see what else. Uh, well, it actually does go down here as well, and it goes over there to the base as well. But that is the crucial thing, the difference, the actual voltage there and there. 
And how is that voltage achieved? It's a differential that's achieved. It's a voltage above and below zero. Actually quite a small voltage. And according to what I can read here, it looks like 1.3 volts. And it looks like minus 1.1 volt. I can't be certain, but it would make sense that it would be that. That's what we sort of expect here. And how is this achieved? Well, the way this is achieved is actually by creating a current flowing through something that drops voltage, that creates a voltage differential, a voltage drop between those two points, where we want a bias voltage here and a bias voltage there. How do you create that differential? Well, with a current flowing through some devices, some components, you will get a differential. One of those components would be a resistor. Whenever you have a current going through a resistor, you use Ohm's law, V equals IR, so you get a voltage difference. Another thing that drops voltage is a diode. And the diode is actually more predictable. It's not a variable voltage, although it does vary slightly with the amount of current going through and also with its temperature, but it's actually quite predictable. And that's exactly what this device is doing here. What this is, is actually an STV4H. It's a quadruple diode array. So what is this? And why do you have four diodes there? And why do we have a quadruple diode array? Well, we have a four diode array because we want four diode drops, which would be about 0.6 volts per, per, per diode. So this would be about 2.4 volts diode drop when current flows through there. Well, that'll force immediately point, uh, 2.4 volts approximately between that point and that point. But we can actually increase that slightly if we give this a bit of resistance. This variable resistor set at zero would mean that the voltage difference between that point and that point would be 2.4 volts, say. If we increase this resistance, depending on the current flowing through these diodes, we would also get a voltage drop across the variable resistor, which would add to the diode drop that the quadruple diode array is creating. Now this STV4H, I've actually found very, very murky details on it. This is about as good as it's gonna get. If we follow this here, here we go. STV4H, whatever SAC means, it's silicon. And they state that this thing has a drop of between 2.1 and 2.3 volts at 7 milliamps. That's good enough. We know that. This particular device is no longer available, but it has actually been replaced with a DIY version using four 1N4004 diodes. Now, someone has done the research and found that the characteristics of 1N4004s are close enough to match, or four of them in series, are close enough to match this diode. I've actually found on antiqueradios.com this particular forum post, which gives us information on these diodes and how to replace them. It's talking about finding these diodes, and this is what they look like. And they come in this package, which you then screw on to a heat sink. And we'll talk about that in a second. And because replacements are no longer available, equivalents have been developed at Audio Karma. There's an actual link. And they use four UFs. It's not one ends, it's UF, ultra fast, with some JB weld. And you put them in series and you connect them to what will effectively be the uh, connector to the heat sink. And these are with JB Weld so that the heat dissipates quite well between that heat sink and the diodes themselves. And you can go further and look at the rest. That's fine. So what happens here is that these diodes, this device is actually bolted to the heat sink of these two output transistors. And so that when the temperature of these output transistors increases, it warms up the heatsink, and that will in turn warm up the diodes, and the characteristics of this diode will change in accordance with the 
the characteristic of those transistors. In fact, what it will do, if you can call it that, is it will give it sort of heat feedback. As these go one way, in other words, if they conduct more with heat, then those will force this voltage drop to change to make them conduct less. So you get a stabilization going on and you shouldn't get thermal runaway. You shouldn't get these guys going crazy when they heat up because this is heating up exactly at the same rate as those transistors. And the change that's happening to this with the heat is equal and opposite, if you can call it that, to the effect on those transistors that the heat is happening. I hope that makes sense. The other thing is this resistor here is usually quite small. And the reason it's quite small is you want most of the differential in voltage between these two points to be created by the diodes so that the change in their value, in the value of the voltage drop, is very dependent on the change in temperature. This thing here will not change with temperature. It's away from the heatsink. So whatever portion of that differential voltage is not created by those diodes, in other words, whatever voltage difference above 2 point, call it 2.35 as they say, that you get is created by this thing, which will stay constant regardless of the heat of, or the temperature of the heatsink. That's why most of the voltage drop is created across there, and a small amount is created across here. That's why that thing is fixed to the heatsink. Now, what exactly happens here? Well, we've actually got a current sink, if I'm looking at this correctly. What we have is two diodes over here, and these can be any type of silicon diodes. I think you can use 1N4148s. One and what you'll get is two diode drops, and that is forced to well, current is forced through there because there's a resistor from this point to ground. That resistor is 15K, so you've got 47 volts. It sees a resistor to ground through two diodes, and a current flows through there. And you get a voltage drop across these diodes. And they tell us here that the voltage here is 46 volts. So 47 there, 46 there. It could be 45.8 if you get 0.6 volts per diode, but let's go with their 46. So they're doing 0.5 volts per diode. Well, you've got a fixed voltage there. Now, what else have you got? Well, what you've got is you've got a transistor here, which is a silicon, effectively a PN junction, which also has a, let's call it 0.5 volt voltage drop. In this case, the drop is from there to there. So this is 46, that'll be 46 plus 0.5 volts, which is right, it says 46.5 volts. Now what you've got is a resistor between two voltages that have been established by the rest of the circuitry. So you've got 47 over here, 46.5 over here, and you've got a 120 ohm resistor over here. So that forces four milliamps approximately to flow through here, again, Ohm's law, 0.5 volts divided by 120 ohms is just over 4 milliamps. That current that is being forced to flow through here, 4 milliamps, goes into there, into the emitter, because it's a PN transistor. Some of it is the actual bias current, which flows from there through that resistor to ground, some of it. However, most of it, because the transistor has gain, most of it flows that way through out, as it were, out of the uh, collector. And that current there, aided in fact by this resistor here, some current also flows from there to that point there, that current is then forced through this chain here, which is the double or the quadruple diode and the variable resistor, where it meets that transistor which is actually taking your input signal from there and it's sort of it's acting as a simple transistor amplifier and your signal then goes to the rest of the chain okay and that's what we have we have this transistor those diodes the variable resistor and again this transistor as well creating the signal uh, to both sections of the ab uh, class ab stage and with that bias point being established. And therefore, my belief is that the problem is in this section here somewhere. And we've got quite a few candidates. It could be those diodes. 
There could be too little or too much current being forced through this uh, transistor. So we'll have to check that. It could be this transistor itself. It could be the diodes themselves, this quadruple diode itself. The variable resistor could actually be gone as well, but I don't think so. And because the signal is actually getting through, I don't think it's this one. This one's actually amplifying the signal that goes out. We are getting a signal up to a point and then it just goes a bit crazy. I think it's probably either the, the, this quadruple diode, the transistor, or these diodes. And that's exactly what I'm going to look at first. We shall see. I love it when a plan comes together. This transistor here is the uh, transistor in the current source. That top one in the suspect uh, branch that I mentioned. And look what happens when I stick it in this highly advanced, super duper component tester. So I think our transistor is dead. Let's have a look with the multimeter. We'll put it on diode check. On big brother here. Nothing. 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 This thing is completely open. Nothing. Sorry, that was out of shot there. This thing is completely open. No diode signal, no shorts, it's dead. And this is the uh, 2SA9912. And I'm going to put in the uh, 2SA992, which is fairly close, it's slightly lower power. But considering this thing's got 46 volts across it uh, and it's passing 4 milliamps, I don't think we should have a problem there. The uh, voltage capabilities are lower than this one as well, but again, shouldn't be a problem in the voltages we're working with. And I'm going to put it in and see what we get on that, uh, trying to set the question current again. Now, I'm going to get ready with the trimmer pot. Just get the screwdriver ready in there, just in case it's very high when I switch it on, so that I can very quickly make an adjustment, and I'm going to hit it. Ah, 22 millivolts. Let's try and get it close to 40. 32, 34. Now, obviously, this thing's going to warm up, so I'm going to leave it a bit lower like I did the other one. But we were, we're now able to adjust it. So that was our problem. Isn't that groovy? I'm just reducing the limit putting more light bulbs in there and we're just under 40 now it's obviously warming up and it's going to take a while and i have to be careful that i don't let it run away with itself which it shouldn't do but just in case bring it down this thing's pretty easily adjustable so i think we found our culprit now all I need to do is do the other test. Actually, I'm going to set both sides to 40 milliamps, let it warm up for a few minutes. And then I'm going to do that test again and see if this thing clips. It could still clip. This could be just one problem. It certainly was wrong. It was, uh, there was something wrong with this transistor. And um, that is not to say there's nothing else wrong with it, but this one has been solved. So I'm going to set everything up and do the test to see if this thing clips. And if it doesn't, then I'm going to wait for an order that's on its way with new transistors. I want to use uh, transistors from the same batch to replace those two that I used um, as the differential in the differential amp. Those two dual, the dual transistor that I replaced with two transistors, which happen to be exactly the same transistors as this one, by the way. 
at USA 992. And um, you see it's creeping up a bit. And that's why they say you should wait and then readjust it. But it's doing nicely. So I'll set that up and get back to you. Remember when I said that something else might be wrong with it? There is. <laughs> well, the original problem is still there. So all that logic, all that waffle, actually helped me find the, uh, the one transistor that was open to solve the bias problem, or rather the quiescent current uh, problem. But the clipping problem is still there. So, best laid plans and all that. Back to the drawing board. But at least we've solved one problem for now. I've got to admit this thing had me stumped for a while because all the logic that I used to come to the conclusion that the only problem or the only source of the problem could be prior to this sort of uh, mirrored set of transistors did help me to find that problem there with that, with that transistor. However, the logic then started breaking down because I couldn't understand why you were getting symmetrical clipping. The only condition that would allow for symmetrical clipping is if you had exactly the same problem above the baseline as you had below. In other words, you'd need two of these transistors opposites to uh, have suffered a fault simultaneously. But then I got a bit lucky because I went and looked at another service manual which is similar to this one, but uh, for a different model, the 440A. And let me show you what that tells us. The 440A actually has a circuit description. Part of that's come out, part of the uh, actual diagrams are the same, but it has a circuit description. And what they do is they talk about the amplifier, the, the amplifier itself. And they actually break it down to something pretty simple. You've got basically the same setup over here involving that uh, differential amp and the uh, signal driver and the current source and the diodes. But then it gets more interesting because they actually, this, this by the way, this over here is the feedback loop, comes from the output and goes to that transistor in the differential pair. But then it tells us, it shows us this part in a very simplified form. And if you follow this, and if you assume that the signal is now here, it's coming out of the differential, goes through this transistor, which is the, it's a voltage amplifier really, and it gets to here, and that gets fed to there, which means that it goes down here, and the same signal is actually being transposed further up, by the difference in voltage. In other words, it's, it's gaining a DC offset here with the difference in voltage over here. So you've got the signal up here as well. And that signal gets fed into this, this line here. What this tells us is what we've actually got here is only a Darlington pair. That's a Darlington pair for the upper part of the waveform. That is a Darlington pair for the lower part of the waveform. That capacitor there is simply to uh, reduce high frequency oscillations, as is that one there. Basically, you're increasing the Miller effect of this transistor pair over here. But then you look at these two and those two, and the question is, what the hell do they do there? Well, we don't have to look much further. It actually tells us differential pair, voltage amplifier, and then it tells us the current gain is provided by the fully complementary Darlington pairs of Q12, Q13, so that's that one and that one, for the, for the positive swing, 14 and 15 for the negative swing, so that one and that one. So far, so good. The upper stage bias is set by the quadruple diode and RV1, we know that. But here's the interesting part. The output stage is protected from short circuit and overload by transistors Q8 through Q11, which short out the driving signal when current through the output transistors reaches an excessive level. 
And when you look at this, it obviously makes sense. When the current through this line here, in other words, if the voltage swing is so high that the current here exceeds a certain amount, the voltage here will actually turn that transistor on. And that transistor will turn that one on, which in turn shorts it to, uh, to ground effectively. And the same applies here with the negative swing. So the purpose of these two transistor pairs here is precisely to act as limiters for the case of an excessively high voltage level over there produced by the output transistors. So that this is to do exactly what we're seeing in the, in the case of that one channel. So I decided to consider the possibility that indeed two of these were faulty and something was a little awry over here. And just as well I did, this type of schematic makes everything look a bit simpler than the full schematic, which as you can see is a little bit more complex. You've got the two transistor pairs here. You've also got some capacitors and you've got diodes and you've got all sorts of crap going on here. But um, the simplified form actually makes it a lot easier. So what I decided to do is to start looking at these transistors here. Now, I didn't expect them to be completely open or shorted because they were just doing their job. What I expected to find was that two of them were actually switching on too early. So they must have started leaking somewhat. And um, what I did then is I swapped these two. Now, Q13 and 15. This uh, NPN is a, here we go, 2SC1815. And I can get those. I got that exactly. And the other one is, here we go, 2SA1015. And I managed to get those as well. Now, the idea is, these two are complementary pairs, and you should try and get them with the same sort of gain and especially the same VBE. So they should be fairly well matched. So ultimately what you want is that whatever current switches on this transistor here starts the clipping process or the shunting process. Practically the same inverse signal will appear on here and it'll start the shunting process on the negative half cycle. So you want them to act approximately on the same level. You can obviously change that. In fact, I think you can probably just remove this. If you remove these transistors, you'll have no um, overload protection and these things could run away. But you can actually change the level at which these start switching off. And I would presume the way to do that would be probably with this resistor here because that is creating a sort of voltage divider. Let's say you have, you need about 0.6 volts there, less than that for it to start conducting. So you'd need a, you get a voltage divider. If, if you've got say 1.4 volts there, it goes in here, that's 1.4. And then you've got a 0.7 volt diode drop, you've got a 3.3k, I think it is, 22k, and you've got to work it out, but the voltage there won't be 1.4, it'll be, say, 0.6. And I've actually worked it out, I think the maximum current you want here to get the peak, um, peak power is uh, 1.4 volts. So you'd get your 0.7 when you have 1.4. If you change that, you'll get the point, if you reduce that one, you'll get the 0.7 um, before, uh, you know, at, at an earlier stage, at a lower voltage there. So you can change that. And that may need changing, as I'll show you now, because I've done this. And may need changing because these transistors are probably not exactly the same as the originals. But they are matched. And what I've done is, I've actually done it for both sides, both channels. I've changed all these transistors. I managed to get these ones here a slightly higher current. I couldn't get the exact ones they wanted. So I used uh, BC327 and 337, which are again a complementary pair, PNP and NPN. Uh, but because I've changed the types of transistors, I would 
need to adjust the feedback or rather the detection resistors here in order to get to clip the same position. But what I want to see is if we've solved the problem. So let's have a look at that and uh, see if we've conquered the beast. So what we have at the moment, I've got everything set up. I've got Big Brother measuring um, the right channel's uh, bias current, crescent current. Small Brother is measuring the left channel's uh, bias current. Scope is on. Signal generator has got a one kilohertz uh, sine wave coming in. Put this guy on. It's on limit. And let's hit it. Protect is off. Now let's see what happens here. Now what we're getting is those guys going very bright, so I'm going to bypass protection and see what happens. There we go. Now, we're getting about 18 volts. And look what happens afterwards. It starts clipping. In fact, it starts clipping pretty much on both sides. So that tells me that um, something has changed the level at which this thing started to protect. That is not a fault, that's actually a protection going on, which is great. And I'm getting, as I said, 17 volts. It's about 40 watts, I think, into 8 ohms, which is a bit lower than what it should be. Before I change the transistors, I believe it was going up to 23 point something volts, which is uh, 70 something watts. So, I'm going to do the following. I have to get transistors, get the proper transistors to fin uh, finish that, uh, that pairing in the protection circuit. There's obviously a, quite a difference between the ones I put in there and the ones that should be in there. And I'll then adjust this. I've got to wait for components as usual, so I'm not going to sit around and uh, keep this project open. I'm going to close this video for now. So basically, we've got ourselves the amplifier that's got fixed. There's something else. I've actually fixed the dial lamp. I've replaced both of them just with a LED. This thing uh, receives, uh, the dial lamp receives something like 11 volts, 11.7 volts AC. So what I did was I put a 1N4007 diode in series. Uh, into a LED, a bright LED, and a 470 ohm resistor, and that's the brightness that I think is suitable for this. The uh, power meters are fine, nothing to change on there. I know this thing was sort of an orangey red, I decided to leave it with a white LED, it comes out as yellowish, which is fine. And other than that, I think basically I think you've seen as much as you want to see of this amp. I, I know that I'm a bit sick of it by now. I know that it uh, seems quite simple when you look at it in a video, but I've been waiting around for components and then I've been finding different faults and it gets a bit monotonous after a while. I want to close this up. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to order components when they arrive. I just have four transistors to change. Uh, on the protection circuit, I also have that other those two up front, you know, the differential pair, I'll change those out on both sides. We've got the biasing working perfectly. If we look at the Crescent current, it's supposed to be 40. I just had a signal through there, so it's obviously cooling down a bit. And the same on the other side, practically the same on the other side. So uh, I think this little uh, washed amplifier has come back to life. And it's certainly going to get some use. Well, once again, I want to thank you all for your patience. Thank you for sticking around. This uh, project started off as a bit of a joke with the bath and all that jazz. But I think I'm going to be pretty happy with the result. I'm happy that I got this thing working. And um, I'm actually going to use it. I like it. I like it. I like the 
the sort of old school feel of things, you know? Switches and stuff. And when you click it, it actually gives you a satisfying clunk and you know it's all for on. Once again, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please subscribe, share, like, and all that jazz. And if you want to support the channel, you can do so on Patreon. There's details at the end of the video and also in the video description below. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.